Painful reminders that police reforms are long overdue. Hi, everybody. It's Reporters Roundtable. I'm David Cruz. Our panel today, Colleen O'Day, senior writer and projects editor for NJ Spotlight News. Sean Sullivan is a reporter for NJ Advance Media. And Daniel Munoz is the business reporter for The Record USA Today Network. We're going to hear from them in just a few minutes. But we begin today with a discussion about reforming policing in New Jersey and I guess by extension the United States, as if we could accomplish that in 10 minutes. But our guest today is a great source for a discussion about this. He is a partner at Patterson, Belknap, Webb and Tyler. He is the independent federal monitor for the Newark Police Department and former state attorney general. We welcome back to Reporters Roundtable, Peter Harvey. General, good to see you again, man. Welcome. Good, good to see you, David. Thank you so much for having me. So I, I assume you've been following uh, this story about the Patterson shooting. Najee Seabrooks, a crisis interventionist, shot and killed by police after a standoff brought on by his own emotional crisis. A textbook case, it would seem, of why we need more crisis intervention programs and better training for police, no? Yes, you put your finger on it, training. Uh, I just don't think that cities and towns invest enough in training and invest enough in examining their existing policies and, and revising them or writing new ones. Sometimes no policy exists, therefore no training exists. So, so you have to look at the policies you have with respect to crisis intervention uh, for people who are suffering from some mental episode and then uh, determine what you want your officers to know and where you want them to draw upon other city services where you may not have to use lethal force. And, um, you know, one, we have a resource in New Jersey for this, right at Rutgers University. It's the Center on Policing. Uh, but I, I don't think enough chiefs, enough city managers, enough mayors uh, access that uh, knowledge. And they are, of course, part of the Newark monitoring team. Yeah. And and but but I think it, it's an issue of training. It's an issue of policies and it's an issue of management. There's been a lot of talk about the need for trained, unarmed crisis workers to take on a role that many police say uh, they're forced to take on and for which police and, and residents say they're not properly trained. Right. Yes. And the question is, who takes the lead in a particular situation yeah. and who provides backup? Because in some situations, as you, as your question uh, implies, social service workers, uh, mental health professionals should take the lead. In other circumstances where there really is a risk of serious bodily harm uh, to others, the police may need to take the lead, but they have to be trained so that they don't overreact and use deadly force where it's not called for, when a, less, a lesser force could have solved the problem. We saw the governor talk about a $10 million investment in the Arrive Together program that pairs social workers and, and crisis teams with police. But that's $10 million uh, for that when in Patterson alone, for instance, the public safety budget is $43 million. Uh, are lawmakers and political leaders not ready to commit real dollars to police reform? Well, that you, you raise a budgetary concern. I think cities have to put in the money in addition mm. to the state. You know, you just can't run to Trenton and say, fund me, because we have too many municipalities and we don't yeah. have shared services in counties. So counties are going to have to step in. Cities are going to have to step in. Uh, but most importantly, it starts with city administration and police leadership looking at their existing policies, finding out whether they even have a policy that covers this. And if they don't, writing one and getting help to write a good one. And then secondly, write the training that accompanies the policy and train your officers. Look, we train our officers on how to use their gun. Some police departments, I know with federal law enforcement, every quarter they go in and they have to fire a certain number of rounds. It may be 100, 125 rounds. So if we are that dedicated to training them so that they know how to use deadly force, 
we should be equally as committed to training them on how to de-escalate and how to engage with people who really should not be killed, but rather should be handled, they should be subdued in a safe way, safe manner to themselves and to the officer and to the public. Yeah, on, on Chatbox, we were talking with uh, Lisa Chowdhury, uh, who is with the Patterson Healing Collective, and she said something that was, was both spot on and really poignant in the context. She said the only tools that the officers had were their guns, so that's what they used. Well, they have more tools than that. that, that that's the default tool. Yeah. They, they have conversation. They have other uh, uh, equipment that allows them to surround a, a, an individual to protect themselves. They have shields uh, that you, you see them. For example, if there's a threat of a riot, they yeah. pull out the shields. I, I mean, my point is that there are other means and methods by which you can subdue someone having a mental health crisis, and you should call in other city services. They're experts in, in the city who can help you. But my guess is that they've never trained together. They probably don't know each other. Mm. And there's no policy or training that educates the officer. So the default is not the gun. The default is the training. And the training is, oh, get so-and-so on the phone. Yeah. Pull out the such-and-such -such team. Let's see if we can handle this. And here's the other point. You have time. If someone is alone, they don't have a hostage, they're barricaded in a room, you have time. You don't have to act right away unless there's some threat that that the building is going to be detonated or something. You have the time to wait it out, calm things down, and you the person to come out. Newark had a hostage situation a couple of years ago, pre-pandemic. Uh, a guy who had hostages, who had weapons, and it was resolved peacefully. He ultimately surrendered because they were patient enough, in part, <clears throat> in part due to the training in the off that the officers received as a result of the consent decree. That's uh, it was a real um, success. That's a nice transition for us. Um, you are the federal monitor for the city of Newark Police Department. Give us an update on the city, which a lot of people are pointing to as a model for reform. Where are you right now, and and where do you still need to go there? We're in year seven of the consent decree. It was an original five years with a two-year extension. We're in the second year of that two-year extension. And some of the work was slowed because of the pandemic. We just couldn't meet in person. Right. We couldn't, uh, Newark couldn't do trainings in person. We couldn't do audits in person. Everything had to stop. There was a state of emergency declared in the state of New Jersey, as you know, as well as the city of Newark. Newark is doing uh, pretty well, and they made substantial progress in a number of areas from their writing of over 15 policies covering everything from use of force, stops, search, searches and arrests with or without a warrant to uh, internal affairs to uh, property and evidence. They've also written new and refreshed training to accompany those policies. Newark also has a bias-free policing policy and training that accompanies it. So you've got those policies, you have that training. Uh, they're giving attention now to an area that is often neglected by police organizations, but not by the Newark PD. That is community engagement. What is it? Most departments don't have a policy that covers it. And in fact, what is it? It's not community policing. It's not better patrols. How do you engage with the community on a precinct by precinct level? Identify the stakeholders in that community, in that particular neighborhood, and get to know them and they get to know the, the commanders and the officers in a particular precinct, as well as the youth. So you have a youth engagement strategy. And Newark is giving considerable attention to that right now, as a matter of fact. What are the prospects for a real civilian complaint review board uh, happening in, in Newark or any other towns? Well, you have one created by the consent decree. It's paragraph 13 of the consent decree. So there's a With civilian the oversight power. entity there. Well, it depends on what kind of power that you want them to have. Yeah. I, I am, our Supreme Court has said you cannot give the power to conduct their own parallel disciplinary proceedings when you have internal affairs in a police organization and you have a, a disciplinary structure that's been negotiated uh, with the unions and that um, 
uh, has an administrative procedure attached to it. You can't, our Supreme Court has said, don't create a parallel administrative procedure so that the officer is trying to comply with both and the commanders are trying to comply with both. So, uh, but what the civilian oversight entity can do is review trends. They can review policies. They can review training. They can attend training sessions. They can review everything from who are you arresting? Uh, how, what, how many people are you arresting? What is the gender? What is the race? How have you resolved internal affairs complaints? How quickly do you resolve them? What discipline has been imposed? They can do a lot of oversight and report out to the city council, report out to the mayor, and have conversations with police leadership where they see something or a trend that they don't particularly like. So there's some real authority there, but it may not be what, what many want that oversight entity to have. But there is real responsibility and, and real authority. It has to be exercised, though. All right. Still some ways to go. Peter Harvey, always good to talk to you, man. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. Thanks for the invitation, David. Stay well. You too. All right, panel, Colleen, Sean, Dan, good to see you all. Sean, you've been on this Patterson story this week. Tragedy and irony abounding there, no? A crisis worker in crisis, his colleagues standing by to help but not allowed to. Yeah, I mean, I remarked a couple of times this week that if, you know, if you had written this in a movie, you know, you would have rejected it as too trite. The, the, yeah. the idea that somebody who uh, dedicated uh, their career uh, and, you know, their life to, uh, you know, working to stop violence on the streets actually survived shooting himself uh, previously uh, to then, uh, you know, be shot and during a me mental health crisis, uh, you know, it, it just uh, just com compounding tragedy, really. Colleen, uh, public safety was a thing for a minute in the legislature, but in an election year, prospects for movement on uh, civilian complaint review board and, and a whole host of other police reform issues, not much uh, energy for that right now, right? I mean, I would think not because the entire legislature is up for re-election um, and the Republicans typically, you know, go crime, anti-crime is kind of one of their things. And so I don't think that the Democrats would like to, you know, put forward any of these measures that make them look softer on crime, for yeah. lack of a better word. Not, not that that's the case. I mean, certainly the, this incident and past incidents make it clear that there needs to be some sort of a change because um, what we have is not working. Yeah. Uh, I, I think what you're going to see in that. The, I'm sorry, Sean, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I just I, th I think what you're going to see in the immediate aftermath in the weeks to come uh, is is definitely, you know, as you mentioned, the Arrive Together program, a doubling down on that. And, I, you know, I think the question, uh, the, the real policy debate that comes out of this is going to be, uh, you know, the appropriateness of the response. Peter Harvey referred to, you know, who who's in charge uh, when, when they respond there. You know, the, the, the folks who uh, at the Patterson Healing Collective, uh, where Najee C. Brooks uh, worked, you know, have said that police really aren't the folks who uh, should be leading the charge here. And they point to this, uh, you know, the response, in this case, a five hour standoff. They say that they were turned away um, as evidence uh, of that. And so, you know, the Arrive <clears throat> Together program, Still puts police in charge. It pairs them with mental health professionals, um, but um, you know it remains to be seen whether that's going to be the prescription uh, statewide or whether um, you know this incident underscores uh, you know the the difficulty when you're you, you know applying uh, you know a SWAT team type response. Yeah. To, um, uh, go ahead. You were saying applying a SWAT team response. Uh, yeah, to a to a mental health crisis like this. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so not much energy for police reforms, especially now uh, since budget season has begun. Dan, you're the business guy. Let's figure out this budget for lawmakers. Uh, let's start with New Jersey Transit. COVID money uh, has staved off the inevitable, which could be a dedicated uh, tax to fund the agency or crazy yearly fare increases. Are lawmakers even trying to figure this out? It doesn't look like that. It looks like uh, there's some sort of, quote, fine print um, money coming from the New Jersey Turnpike Authority that's going to New Jersey Transit through, I believe, 2028. Um, but that's not legislation. That's not guaranteed into law. That's a memorandum, memorandum of uh, 
tongue twister uh, memorandum of understanding. Yeah. So that could uh, be undone if the economy sours, which is something that we're looking like uh, recession coming up. Uh, going into COVID, we uh, the legislator had wanted to have a dedicated source of funding. It doesn't look like that's that's going to happen. Steve Sweeney and Loretta Weinberg were really pushing the charge on that for years, and both of them are no longer in the state legislature. Yeah, you saw what it got them. <laughs> Colleen, <laughs> Colleen, it ain't tax season unless we're talking about school funding. So you had a piece on the winners and losers in that department. Uh, what would you find out? So, you know, the governor has touted that that once again, we're having record high school funding. Um, it's going up. It's uh, eight hundred and thirty million dollars. And uh, we're a year away. They certainly are hoping to get to what it would be considered full school funding, fully funding the school aid formula, which is a pretty complicated formula. I can't say I understand all of it, but when you when you put it down into the numbers, um, 400 districts are getting an increase, and I'm sure every single one of them is happy to be getting more money. But you've got more than uh, a quarter of the districts, about 157, that are getting a decrease in aid. Um, and in some cases, that is millions of dollars. In Jersey City's case, it's uh, tens of millions of dollars. And that is always a problem then when you get to the local taxpayers. And that it, I mean, it, it means a property tax increase or it means staff cuts. Maybe it means both. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it bears repeating that the people who pay for the local schools are the local taxpayers. Uh, Sean, there's 90 million, I think, in the budget for a new women's detention center to replace Edna Mann. Uh, what's the rest of that story? Well, it, it seems like that, you know, the story is that um, after years of, uh, of failing to address, uh, you know, uh, sex abuse and uh civil rights violations and stuff like that, that, you know, the administration has finally uh, got a plan in place to replace Edna Mahan and, um, uh, you know, uh, move the facility uh, elsewhere, uh, put the uh, inmates, uh, uh, many of whom come from, uh, you know, the city's, they're the state's urban centers, put them a little bit closer to uh, their family. Edna Mahan is famously way out in Hunterdon County, yeah. and it's very difficult for uh, folks to visit there. Um, so, you know, uh, it, it does seem like now we uh, that the tide is turning. I, I uh, tuned into a, a meeting uh, with the with the federal monitor that uh, Edna Mahan has. In addition to Newark, there is a federal and uh, her report the, that the state is complying with uh, all of the demands that they made uh, in the complaint that they filed a couple of years ago uh, against the state, which found you know, rampant civil rights abuses. Colleen, you also had a piece about outrage over the reinstatement of a corrections officer charged with uh, sexual assault there. What's up with that? You know, so as, as Sean pointed out, the, the facility is under a federal monitor because of sexual abuse, sexual assault cases. And the irony here is that the man who is um, at least at the appellate division level now, we, we, the case could still go to the Supreme Court and they could yeah. decide differently. But but this um, former corrections officer is one of those who was part of seven who kind of brought this all to light. It was um, there was seven uh, officers back in 2016 who were arrested and charged. Um, this gentleman fought all of all the way through. He was uh, acquitted or found not guilty of the criminal charges and um, the Civil Service Commission, when he complained to them that he was fired, uh, said, yeah, maybe firing was a little bit too far to go. We will just, um, you know, we, we suggest a six month suspension with back pay and the appellate division agreed with that. But the trustees of the facility and uh, the commissioner of the DOC and had have said that, you know, this is unacceptable to, to let someone back in who at the very least admitted to kissing another inmate. Um, he says it was just for a couple seconds she kissed him. Um, it, it, there's a much longer story there, but but it certainly brings the question, well, how, you know, how much can the DOC control this when they're trying very desperately to stop this culture of sexual assault at the facility? Yeah. All right. Switching gears quickly here. Dan, you had an interesting piece about 
the biggest consumer affairs complaints over the past year, 18,000. What were some yeah. of the biggest? Some of the biggest had to do. Some of the biggest had to do with automobiles, um, predatory towing, um, automobiles, uh, car centers, uh, car sales, uh, cars not um, honoring uh, car sale prices, uh, shoddy car repairs, uh, I, I, things also having to do with uh, um, internet appliances, shoddy uh, car contracts, uh, shoddy, uh, a lot of cars. Uh, yeah. Shot, well, that's what you get for being a car culture. How right. how much of this of these get resolved? Uh, some do. Uh, there's uh, the 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 the, uh, the uh, Department of uh, the, uh, the the part Division of Consumer Affairs gives a uh, number and an online complaint form so that you can. Uh, submit your complaint and so that it can be followed up with. We shared it on our website, uh, on our article, so that if it, if uh, if uh, you have been scammed, if you have been cheated, that you can call and you can uh, submit your complaint to the uh, DOJ, uh, to the uh, OAG, the Consumer yeah. Affairs. Colleen, the season of pushing out the old guy continues. Another incumbent retiring this year. Mercer County Executive Brian Hughes saw the writing on the wall. He's giving way to Assemblyman Dan Benson uh, on the Democratic side anyway. Is there a ripple effect coming? Is it, it, Have all the dominoes yet to fall in New Jersey as we head into legislative elections? Yeah, that's a little bit of a mess. Um, so Assemblyman Wayne D'Angelo, who is the fellow assembly member serving with Assemblyman Benson, had actually backed Brian Hughes um, in his reelection bid, which now is ended, um, because Benson got the nomination of the Mercer County Democratic uh, machine. And so Ben uh, D'Angelo then wound up, uh, you know, the odd man out instead of getting nominated again <laughs> for his position in the assembly, the committee chose two newcomers. So uh, D'Angelo finished third and then Benson turned around though and decided he would nominate uh, or he would back D'Angelo. So yeah, it's a little bit of a mess. Um, <laughs> D'Angelo is still going to be on the democratic party um, at least in their column on the ballot. So there's a chance that he could still um, get back, you know, win his primary. But we know that the party line um, often is very powerful in the state. Yeah, it, it really is a tangled web that they weave in this state. Yeah. My goodness. All right. It's time for our only in Jersey moment headlines and notes that are quintessentially Jersey. Dan, let's start with you. You got one for us? Yep. So a piece of the USS Maine, a historic battleship that exploded in uh, 1890, 1898 in Cuba, had found its way to New Jersey to a garage sale in 2000. Um, it turned out to be an actual piece of the USS Maine. Wow. It's going to be donated to Arlington National Cemetery. So it somehow it finds its way only to New Jersey. Remember the Maine. Uh, Colleen and I were just teens uh, during that time. Uh, <laughs> Colleen, you got one for us? Yeah, this one kind of takes us to the uh, uh, world of geopolitics. Uh, I'm sure you all know of the United States of, I'm going to pronounce it right, uh, Kailasa. Uh, well, certainly Newark thought they did, and Newark back in uh, January entered into a sister city agreement with this place that, as it turns out, doesn't really exist. So six days later, someone in City Hall figured out that, um, oops, this isn't really a place, but this was after Mayor Baraka had this ceremony with a representative of this, you know, not real uh, right. country. Um, no one even knows where it is supposed to be located. And it turns out that the guy who's, um, you know, in behind all this is really kind of a, a scam artist, although he calls himself the Supreme Con Pontiff of Hinduism. Um, and he's actually wanted in India for some pretty bad crimes, including a sexual assault. Yeah. Um, kind of embarrassing for Newark. Props to local news, by the way, for, for breaking that story. Uh, Sean, you got one for us? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, uh, 
the Supreme Court uh, issued an order this week uh, concerning a uh, Superior Court judge uh, 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 by the name of uh, Teresa Mullen. And, uh, you know, this case just caught, caught my eye. Uh, it's been working through the courts for a while now. But uh, th this judge uh, was accused of judicial misconduct, which has to do with pulling rank at their children's Catholic school, uh, you know, and in invoking their uh, status as a judge uh, in a dispute there. And I just think that there's nothing more uh, New, New Jersey than uh, doing the don't you know who I am uh, in, a, in a school dispute. You have, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, every, everybody knows that uh, parents get a little bit crazy uh, when it comes to their kids and uh, the, the, the pulling a judicial rank there uh, just uh, sets it apart. Do you know who I am? Mine comes from hopefully NCAA tournament bound Rutgers University. Center Cliff Omaruyi, a Nigerian-born junior who, despite having only started playing basketball at the age of 14, is so good now that he's a finalist for the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar Award. So good that he earned $25,000 in endorsement money. But the story is not that he earned $25,000 in endorsement money, but that he took that $25K and donated it to rehab the basketball court at the Salvation Army Center in Newark. That's where Muhammad Oliver works as a volunteer with the basketball program. Oliver took Omaruyi in, became his legal guardian in the States, and taught him how to play ball. Omaruyi says Oliver changed his life and that this grand gesture was just a small way to say thank you. Throw it down, big man. Go Rutgers. And that's Roundtable for this week. Colleen, Sean, Dan, good to see you all. Thanks also to Peter Harvey for joining us. You can follow the show on Twitter at RoundTableNJ and get a first look at Roundtable and Chatbox when you subscribe to the YouTube channel. I'm David Cruz. From all the crew here at Gateway Center in downtown Newark, thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Major funding for Reporters Roundtable with David Cruz is provided by RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Business Magazine, the magazine of the New Jersey Business and Industry Association, reporting to executive and legislative leaders in all 21 counties of the Garden State since 1954. And by Politico's New Jersey Playbook, a topical newsletter on Garden State politics, online at politico.com.